Okay, we are recording. Here's how, how are you today? Yeah, I'm really well, thank you. It's really nice to be talking to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Where, where are you today? Where's home? I am currently in West London. I'm in Hammersmith at the moment. Oh, nice. Not which too is far, home. Not too far. Ridiculously windy in London today. Yes, insane. I am. Um, I have got a massive kind of unruly dog, who uh, who I tried to take to all the, to, just to take out to a park this morning. They were all shut, so I had to go. Um, I went to Richmond in the end, but I think there must have been a lot of wind damage. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Well, look. Let's jump straight into your song picks and get this playlist started. Um, can you tell me the song that you regard as having the greatest ever intro, please? Mm. Uh, yes. So I was thinking about this for a while and I was thinking, oh, I could go with some kind of epic 70s rock, which had those kind of five minute intros. But actually, the the first song that popped into my head was um, Harry Belafonte, um, Jump in the Line. Um, and I was always quite a big um, fan of Beetlejuice. So if you can remember that that ridiculous scene. So that that was one thing. But I just thought it's it's the one intro every single time it comes on, whoever I'm with, everyone jumps out of their, st their seats and starts yeah. dancing. It's just got such a great, joyful kind of um, vibe to it. So, yeah, that's that's the one for me. It's, that, it's got a lot of sort of Calypso feel to it, hasn't it? Yes, exactly. It's it's just sunshine, isn't it? It just takes yeah. you to, like, summer and drinking on the beach. And, yeah, yeah, it's it's so great. So with that in mind, and and to touch on something that you said previous to that, you know, you, you considered one of them sort of, like, big five-minute epic 70s intros, but you went for something that's very instantaneous. Mm -hmm. um, when you're writing music now, mm. the way that we're seeing people consume music, um, we're seeing very fast moving thumbs that the that, that attention spans seem to be getting shorter and people mm. want that that blast of, of hook, chorus quickly. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying that's right, I'm not saying that's wrong, but I'm gonna ask you that with that in mind and and you know these you know, record labels putting emphasis on things like TikTok being a useful means mm. to get your music out there now and the, the desire to get on the right Spotify playlists. It seems to have shifted a little bit more from, say, 20, uh, maybe even sort of, yeah, 10 years ago of, of wanting to get on radio. You know, radio was always where it was at. And it seems to be shifting a little bit. Um, mm. And that shift also does seem to involve, you know, the, the sort of shortening of attention spans. Is I've asked this question about 400 times. I've never managed to frame it exactly how I want to frame it. So bear mm -hmm. with me. But mm -hmm. I just want to know, does any of these kind of trends in how people are now consuming music in these bite-sized ways or the, the, the you know writing something that's bang, starts with a chorus to get on these playlists, does any of that ever filter into your creative process? Uh, I I can very honestly say no, um, but I think I'm, I feel like with my age, I'm 37, I'm a bit, I feel like I'm getting into this cantankerous, rebellious stage of like, I'm not going to follow these trends. And, yeah. and it, it definitely brings up this real resistance in me to, to reduce something that could be so, um, I hate the word organic, it sounds really wanky, but um, that could just be flowing and long and just a journey. I, you know, I, that's what I love when I listen to music is listening to the, the journey of a song. And if you're cutting, you know, seconds here or there and trying to make it as um, impactful as possible at the start of the song, it just loses that. And I think you can always tell when someone's crowbarring that kind of structure into a song. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, and it, it just feel, feels so wrong to me. So I think I go the other way of wanting to do, you know, eight minute songs and yeah. Um, yeah. Is that something that, that, you know, you said that you can hear it when people sort of crowbar that, that snippet in to grab you right from the off. When, as somebody that, that, that makes music, do you, can you sit back and hear a track on the radio and just take it on face value or... Is it in your nature as as a as a musician as a songwriter to deconstruct it 
and look at how it's put mm. together. Oh, hang on, I wouldn't have done that really because that could change my life. And like, do you know what I'm saying? Do you, can you yeah, just go yeah, yeah. and just listen to it without sort of looking behind the curtain? <clears throat> Uh, it, you know what I the good thing is I'm, I was never very theoretically taught myself so I never go oh nice whatever it is g minus seven there I I never know those things but <laughs> yeah. but if I if I hear like a really good hook like a really catchy chorus I'll be like that's great that's amazing yeah. um that's kind of the stuff that I pick up on I think I can you know what, I can appreciate a really well-written song. Like I can, there's a formula definitely that I can hear a lot on radio too, especially. Yeah. Like that is a beautifully crafted song, mm. but I also feel like I can hear when people are writing for radio too as well, yeah. which yeah. which is something that again, doesn't sit particularly well with me, but, but it can be a really well-crafted song by fantastic musicians yeah. at the same time. There's, there's definitely been a big influx of male singer songwriters in the vein of Ed Sheeran in the last 10 years that are writing songs for radio to 100%, mm. 100%. And you can hear it a mile yeah. off. Like, yeah. <clears throat> okay, well, look, if I'm going to take you back and I'm going to ask you to tell me the first song that you remember hearing that had an emotional impact on you, please. Yes, so the i immediately went to not necessarily the song but the the singer when, okay. when I got with this question and i thought about the voice a voice that stays with you and kind of haunts you from the get go and you immediately uh, you know looking at cassettes at, as it was back when i was a kid of like what who is this like what who is this person and it was bill withers yeah um and i'd already heard lovely day or, mm -hmm. you know and known that there was this great voice but it was grandma's hands. And I think there's nothing musically that happens in that song. You know, it's just that rhythmic guitar behind that ghostly voice. And just even as a kid, those lyrics are so simple, but you can, you can feel the emotion behind his voice, but I think it's, you can even hear as a kid, the depth of what's happening in those lyrics. You know, you can take it as just, you know, words of this yeah. lady picking up, you know, I, her grandson falls down and all these different images, but there you can feel the depth, even as yeah. whatever age you're at. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Mm. Where would you have heard that? Where was home? Home was Suffolk for me. Um, and my mum's parents lived up in Scotland. So I remember always doing these massive car drives up north. Yeah. Um, and I, my, my sisters and my brother are a lot older than me. So they'd always be picking and choosing music, but occasionally my mum would get one in and it was always Bill Withers with her. So, um, so I got to know his music so well, but it was grandma's hands. I think is, yeah, that simplicity of, of the way he wrote songs. It's, it's really strange that like, every time I ask this question, everybody has completely different answers, but the amount of people that will go in my parents' car, <laughs> Yeah, and I wonder if that's still a thing. I wonder if oh, mm. you know, young people now are uh, headphones screens. obsessed with their phones, screens. Mm. Like, does that day of you know you've got six tapes in the car, and like yeah. they're probably going to be on rotation for the journey to to wherever. I wonder if that will be as powerful a platform to to get exposed to music and to you know staring out the window thinking christ how long till we get there but yeah. you know having to listen to you know whoever's in the car's choices to to put the that tapes is, on i never thought about that yeah you're right that kind of the way boredom is such a special thing i've yeah. realized of for having that time and that space to be bored and then let that music sink in yeah. you're absolutely right rather than a million different things happening at once and watching screens you're not letting that kind of audio yeah. sit as deeply as it would otherwise. Yeah. Mm. Tell me what the exact emotion was when you heard that Bill Withers track. Um, I think curiosity, because there's something about, you know, when you hear a really good storyteller or a, a voiceover, you just want to lean in like that curiosity and 
uh, and listen, you know, wondering who, gra yeah, wondering who grandma is, basically, yeah. the whole way through of, you know, these cracked hands and you get more of a sense of her as it goes on. It, not necessarily more curious about him, but yeah, more curious about grandma. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I don't think I felt any, there is a sorrow in that song I I hear now, obviously, but yeah. of of Bill lovingly speaking about her, but there's a there's a real sweetness and a love there. I think that's what that's the curiosity. Yeah. Tell me about the song that reminds you of your time at school. Oh God. Um, yeah. So this, I was thinking. I went to an all girls Catholic boarding school, um, um, which was an interesting place run by nuns, right. and uh, so I kind of took myself back there, thinking, you know, um, was that in Suffolk? That was no, that was in Ascot, actually. Um, but I was thinking of the amount of times, you know, again, no phones, what we would do listening to what was out the moment. It was Natalie and Brulia mm. with Torn was like the massive pop single of the moment. Yeah. So you can imagine all these very kind of emo teenagers staring up at their ceilings, kind of singing Torn. <laughs> so it's not the coolest answer in the world, but I just have so many memories of walking into friends rooms and every single one being yeah. kind, of, <laughs> kind of lying looking up at the ceiling listening to natalie and brulia but it, you know what it's it's a banger of a tune and i've only just realized it was a cover yeah um of I, a uh, swedish I was, I was... duet or something wasn't it what's that sorry was it a swedish duo it, it was that they didn't write it it was um oh god i forgot his name but he came on the podcast about oh a year about six seven months ago and uh, and and he was a, a absolutely fascinating fella that um, I ignorantly hadn't really heard much about. Turns out he wrote the baseline for Love Cats for the Cure, then joined the Cure for years, then oh took a bit God. of time out, wrote two number ones for um, Pixie Lot, and and he said, oh, "I wrote this other song um, for for um, a soap star called Natalie and Brulee." I went, "You wrote Torn," and he was like, "Yeah," and I, and I was looking over his shoulder into his, well, and I went. And he said, like, where he was living, I was like, that explains what paid for that house. Like, you wrote Torn. And, like, yeah, it was. Uh, and she But, yeah, it was. It. You are right. It was written for um, a, 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 a duo that, that had mm. sort of moderate success across Europe with it. And then had the, the beautiful soap star from the 90s. And yeah, there you go. There's your hit. Exploded. Hip. I mean, yeah, it's an amazing, even if it comes in, you know, comes on the radio, whatever today, yeah. it's like, oh, it's still, it's still just as good as it was then, I have to say. Absolutely. Absolutely. That video is entrenched in my brain as well. Yes. I, yes. I, I, oh, my goodness. I'm not ashamed to say, like, I, I, I would have been probably like 19 when that came out. I've never bought a calendar in my life. I had a <laughs> Natalie and Brulia calendar. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh my god. So what what month was um was torn like the kind of in the jeans and the short hair? It was this I mean that haircut we should say as well. Every single girl that was going to any clubs that I was ever at at that time, they all had that haircut. It's Literally, so long hair disappeared. And everybody had the Natalie and Brulia cut. <laughs> I love that you had a calendar. That's amazing. Oh, so my good. gosh. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me a little bit about school. You know, to, to, to boarding school, um, for me, was something that I was threatened with by my parents when I played mm -hmm. up, that I was going to get sent to boarding school. And that terrified me. And I've, I've spoke to many artists that, you know, on this podcast that have been to boarding school and had quite fond memories of it. Um, I don't know if I'm being too judgy here, but the thought of going to a Catholic boarding school run by nuns <laughs> sounds terrifying to me. But but tell me about the reality of it. Uh, the reality wasn't as, as stark as I imagine it is in your mind. It's yeah. not like... Um, I think of the extreme of like the Magdalene sisters. Magdalene sisters overnight. was the first thing that was at the front of my mind. <laughs> yeah. So it wasn't, and I, it is for me too, when I think, oh, you know, Catholic boarding school run by terrifying nuns. But actually, no, they, they were lovely. The nuns were lovely. Um, we were able to be really badly behaved and they were pretty relaxed. Yeah. So for me, boarding school, I don't think it, it is, you're very restricted. Of course you are. You're kind of, we, we we were trapped in these grounds but it did mean that you do um embark on these incredibly close 
amazing friendships with people who I'm still friends with, you know, a dozen of my close school friends, really, really yeah. close with, because you have so much time. And like you, like we've talked about already, not having phones, not having distractions. Yeah. You know, we were writing music all the time. We were listening to music. You, I think there was a lot of space to be really creative. Yeah. So I have really happy memories of, of being at boarding school. Um, albeit, yeah, it always feels like it's sort of dredged in this, this very dark kind of Catholic rigidity. Was you a creative kid? Yes, I, yeah, I was. I, I loved I was thinking musically, not until I was about seven, when I, when I could work my way around the piano. Um, was there one at home? There was one at home, definitely, because I, all my sisters and my brother, I've got, I'm the youngest of five, they all learned to play piano and music was always like a big thing in my family. So there was always like flutes and recorders and guitars and pianos and things like that lying around. Yeah. Um, my poor sister, who's two years older than me, she was learning piano and I was that annoying little brat who competed and then tried to learn everything better than her. So yeah. she gave up and then I was just playing away but um but i i loved writing songs i think from seven and i yeah so i think musically definitely from that age and liked drawing liked writing stories storytelling was always a big thing for me was that kind of creative side of you encouraged at school Ooh, um at secondary i mean at any school hmm. no actually now you say it weirdly the boarding school that we've been talking about, I did find my creativity there, but not the way that they wanted me to. So yeah. you'd have these very rigid, miserable piano and singing lessons. But because I think they were so miserable, I taught myself guitar and yeah. me and friends would then, you know, write songs together and muck about in the music school and yeah. do all sorts of stuff. So yeah, it, it, it out of strictness and feeling a bit trapped, bred another kind of creativity. Yeah. Did you know what you wanted to be when you was at school? Oh, no, I don't think so. Um, I I knew I loved music and I knew I had a kind of flair for music for, I'd never, I, I, I was always thought of as a really bad singer at school, which uh, is funny now because people talk about my voice, but I would, apply, you know, I always wanted to do drama and be an actress and they would never give me the singing roles. Um, other than Judd Fry, I played Judd, because it was an all girls school. Yeah. I played the terrible rapist Judd Fry from Oklahoma, yeah. aged like 15. But again, they, they didn't, they wouldn't give me any of the uh, singing parts, but, um, but no, I didn't realize I wanted to be a musician till way later. Yeah. Um, much, much later in life. You said that you wanted, you know, you enjoyed acting and you like being clearly, you know, you're somebody that likes being on stage and, and, you look very comfortable when you're on stage. Has confidence ever been a problem? Oh yeah, massively. Um, I think I had, it was quite interesting. I, um, when I was about 22, I trained to be a voice coach. So and that was in terms of like working with actors, learning about accents and it was a year long, really intensive course. I think similar to what a, what a kind of actor training course would be. Yeah. And before I did that, I thought I was this really kind of extroverted, really confident person. And then I realized actually, no, I'm quite an, a shy introvert. And it was all a slightly, yeah. uh, a sort of fake approach to life that we all realize a bit later on. Yeah. Um, so no confidence, authentic confidence has been a slow, a slow growing thing, I think, into my 30s, for sure. And as, as much as we start, you know, I, I think grow more comfortable in ourselves as, as, as we get older and, and into our 30s and such. Do you ever, do you ever suffer with imposter syndrome? Do you ever find yourself around, you know, other, you know, creative talents and think, oh my God, how am I here? And I'm taking nothing away from your, your talent, of course. Um, but... I often ask guests this, and I'm surprised when I've, I've spoke to, I've, I've had one of the Foo Fighters in here just say, oh God, if I walk into a room, like the imposter syndrome kills me. And I just think, you're in the Foo Fighters. Like, how can you, how can you? But I also think if you don't have imposter syndrome, I think it's, 
a little narcissistic to, to not yes not yes have a bit of that like so tell me about your relationship with it with impo- it's funny you said that because i i've been recording in the studio recently and it's what's very new to me is is performing with guitar and i sent this to a friend of mine who's this unbelievable um multi-instrumentalist and i went can i have i got away with it was the first thing i said because i've got imposter syndrome so my god i suffer a lot and i am very lucky that i play with some absolutely extraordinary musicians and every time i'm in a room with them i'm like i i sort of slightly become this (laughs) childlike person of is that okay am i doing it right even though i feel like an accomplished musician it always it always creeps its way in somewhere but I, I also love people who, are, I'm the same as you, I think, of, I love people who have that vulnerability or that slight insecurity about them rather than the other way, yeah. which is just, yeah, arrogant and narcissistic, absolutely. Yeah. Tell me about the first song you remember buying from a record store, please. Is that... Ooh, uh, so first song, I'm trying to think of the record store I bought it from. Um, which was Notting Hill Music Exchange. Oh, what a shop. Such a good shop. Oh, and I, I went in there the other day and it's just, nothing changes. Yeah. It's still the same people, I think, who've been working behind the desk yeah. for 40 plus years. But Making me feel uncomfortable for 40 years now. <laughs> yeah. Doing that little judgy look down their nose when I ask yeah. for something, like I should have been into it 10 yeah. years before. Yes. <laughs> it's high oh fidelity my God. all day long in there. <laughs> oh, it's so you're right, and I'm always one of those being like, "Have you got? Have you got this?" And then the the, the, the sigh of disapproval, that, uh, <laughs> like, well, one minute I'll be I'll be five minutes in the back. It's too funny. That's where I get my imposter syndrome. Record shops. <laughs> oh, actually, do you know what? And that is where a lot of arrogant people probably work. Oh like, That's God. <laughs> Um, oh, it is true, but I do love it as well. The the snootiness. Oh, I, it's, it's part of the experience. Yeah, and I'll never match up. It's like yeah. um, uh, oh fuck, I can't remember the what was the Jack Black film in High Fidelity. A, yes, High Fidelity. Yeah. it's totally that, isn't it? Yeah, they nailed it. That it's brilliant. <laughs> um, but I do remember going in and asking for. And probably being, you know, stared down at that moment in time as well. I must have been 16, but I asked for um, Thriller, Michael Jackson. Yeah. Um, I mean, Killer Then, Killer Now, uh, just such an insane track. Um, And that, I think that was the start of my foray into all of Michael Jackson's amazing music. Um, ridiculous I, but even teenagers today i'm thinking teenagers in hundreds of years time they're still going to be like listening to michael jackson for the first time he's always going to be this kind of futuristic god i think yeah. it's it's perfect pop music it mm. doesn't get any more perfect and and there's a lot of it as well it's not mm. like he's got 10 tracks that are killers he's got shit loads and and you talk about Thriller and, and as an album as well. like And it was only the other day that I was talking about intros to, to one of my mates. And he went, has anyone ever chose Billie Jean? And I was like, oh, I don't think so. Mm. And I was like, why has no one ever chose Billie Jean? Mm. Just that snare of that. that oh, that, my God. That, as soon as yeah. it comes in, it's like, well, here comes Billie Jean. And then you've got the bass line. And then, and one of the things as well, like, I'm actually looking at a little, I was really lucky that many, many years ago, I, got, I didn't meet him, but I got a signed picture of Michael Jackson. He's just literally just out of shop there. Amazing. And, uh, and, and one of the things that as much as everybody talks about how incredibly songs are, you know, what a performer he was, but his voice is unreal. And mm. what where I think a good place to, to, to find that out, well, he's any of his records, but, if you listen to Can You Feel It by the Jacksons, mm-hmm. right, in that band, everybody's got amazing voices. Mm-hmm. And for the first verse and chorus, I think it's Jermaine. Uh, and then when you get that, oh, the people love, and, it, and it's Michael sings. It's yeah. like, oh, my God. He just <laughs> took it from, like, seven to, like, 27. It's oh, like, yeah. and it just cuts through. And it's like, oh. his voice is, re- I've got goosebumps talking about this. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. It's that's the best place to really work out just how good his voice is. 
he leaves the rest of the Jacksons just trailing behind as he just grabs that song and runs with it. Because it's note, I, I'm I'm in that bit now as we're talking about it. It's like <laughs> note perfect, and it's so high and pu- yeah. it's the pureness of that tone. Yeah. You're right, but you know they're all fantastic in their own ways. But he yeah. just elevates it with that. But he, I mean, he had such a gift. My God, I don't yeah. think I ever heard him sing a, a dud note. No, no, not at all, not mm. at all. Oh, solid choice, solid choice. Um, I'm going to um ask you now. I, I spoke about confidence a little while back, and you've chose um an insanely difficult. Um, industry uh, to have success in. Tell me about your relationship with Drive and how driven you are. Ooh, good question. Um, I think my drive in the last, I'd say post pandemic actually has just kind of skyrocketed, not for the reason that you would think in that you know we've been stuck indoors but i think and and now we've got it's the time to kind of really go for it but for me i've realized recently that drive when i take it away from me and my own ego of i want to be successful or i want to you know whatever i want my records to do really well i now i see it as like a service i do and if i remove it from me and i'm like this is something i love doing I know it's having an impact when I do gigs. So I just need to do more of it and I want to do it well. And and the group dynamic that we've got at the moment as well, we all feel the same thing. It's like, it's not about us looking cool or any of that. It's just about, can we get this to more people? That would be lovely. Yeah. But at the same time, we're having such a good time doing it. That's about as driven as it gets for me, I think. Yeah. It's like, I like to be of service. And I know that what I'm doing is is doing good for people. It's it's bringing people joy. That's yeah. That that drives me for sure. What else can you give people other than joy? That's perfect. Exactly. Exactly. So wow. I mean that like, live gigs. Oh my god! It never gets old. It's like it's just so fun, especially because I've got this kind of big gospel element, and I have up to six singers sometimes. And I, I sing with a massive gospel choir, so I know the impact it has always, like these yeah. beaming faces. We are, I sing with this choir, Soul Sanctuary, and we do a, a gig in St. James's Church in Piccadilly um, in the square, like once a month. Yeah. And the amount of like passes by, it's like every time it's addictive to people. They're just like, what is this? Yeah. And so I feel the same with my music in a different respect of, bringing people in i get people to get involved i very much want it to be like a a group thing yeah. with the audience um yeah so as an artist that seems to really enjoy that sort of camaraderie of being in a you know a, a, a large a large group of, of, of creative people and, and, and voices and and also that love of performing tell me how you found those two years of lockdown as a as a creator um oh as a creator uh, the the funny thing is the first thing well, when professionally and that, personally i guess oh okay yeah well personally i was thinking i loved it that's terrible to say that <laughs> but i because i'd been away so much and yeah. like on the move being grounded and at home oh, it was so nice i absolutely yeah. love i'm a real homebody yeah i'm not kind of designed necessarily to be touring all the time so yeah. I oh, I enjoyed it so much, but I did realize, okay, you know, now's the time for me to write a new album, nothing. You know, you're not, everyone's talking about COVID. No one's going to see anything. You're not seeing your friends. You're not having interesting conversations. So there was, there's just nothing to spark anything. And that was um, concerning, but also quite um, interesting for me of like, oh, wow, can I pull resources from elsewhere? So I ended up just, scrapping music for a bit and doing like learning about composition film composition and and um illustration and all sorts of different things because i thought that would impact music at a later date so Uh, so your professional kind of head was saying right i've got time i need to mm -hmm. make a record but the creative juices were just going nope yeah 
and I've realized now for me, I only write when I want to write. It's yeah. like I used to try and really force it and get a sit at the piano and swear at my piano and just nothing would come. <laughs> And just and then, you know, open a beer or whatever at yeah. two o'clock is what happened in the pandemic. But yeah. um but it yeah, it was really, really frustrating. And then it takes me, I think, a while to go, okay, this is exactly what I'm gonna be writing about. And for my last album, I was really lucky. I wrote most of it in Holland. Um, so being somewhere completely new after that that kind of being shut indoors. Yeah being in a new bustling city with new kind of energy around you. Just, I wrote about 10 songs in three days. It was crazy. And I'm never, that's, yeah. I'm not as driven as to say, I'm going to write a song today. It's just yeah. not the way I work. Yeah. So let's go clubbing. Tell me the song <laughs> that soundtracked your years clubbing. Um, so I went to uni in Glasgow. Um, right. and I lived there for about seven years. Best best city in the world it's so good and I still go up there quite a lot and um you used to go the main club there is called sub club down under these arches and the song at the time was over and over by hot chip which I mean actually that could be the greatest intro as well it just mm. again as soon as that song comes on whatever age you're it's such an addictive rhythm and groove to it yeah and it's yeah it's just very vibey it's just such a sexy kind of under produced track in a yeah. way yes yeah, it's, it's it's amazing so was you a big clubber when you was in glasgow a, a fake clubber i think what's a I fake clubber a fake clubber in that all my mates loved clubbing and they were into gabba and i was like oh god oh so god. i would i know i know <laughs> and i and so i i was the sort of I'm making friends. <laughs> I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go clubbing and go and listen to Gabba um, for hours, and then oh, um, you'll be telling a therapist about that one day. I will. I will. <laughs> it all started with Gabba. <laughs> yeah, but like, all, exactly. <laughs> the nightmare of Gabba. So yeah, I'd say fake clubbing, but that song it was not fake clubbing. That song, I yeah. it would come on and it would just I wouldn't stop, be able to stop dancing. But yeah, compared to the Gabba, I mean yeah. that song was glorious. Wonderful. I'm going to take you home for this track. And it's a favourite song from an artist from your home county, please. Oh, there's a lot. There's a lot of amazing artists from London. Mm -hmm. um, and one of my favourites, who I think is so underrated, is Jamie Woon. Mm -hmm. Who, um, What I like about Jamie Woon is he doesn't try and fit in a box. He does not try and write songs for specific radio stations he does exactly what he wants to do yeah. and i think the result of that is he has such an authentic kind of cool air about him and he writes these amazing vibey songs one of which is called sharpness mm. um i don't know if you know it but it was I, I know, i'm very very uh big on jamie bone and, oh, yeah, he's... and and for this i i caught his um uh jules holland yeah. live performance of it and it was him and it was uh, a friend of mine that i know that was back, one of his backing singers it was him kind of and this other guy sitting on stools looking really cool david kumu who i'm a massive fan of on guitar and it's just the coolest song i think one of the coolest songs ever written like every time i listen to it i think it is perfect from yeah. his beautiful soulful voice and then those when those synths come into that yeah. I guess that pre-chorus is yeah, so cool. He's uh, he's so overlooked, and mm. I think it was it was when I first heard I heard Lady Luck uh, mm -hmm. when it, and I was like, oh my god, what's this? This guy's voice is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And then I bought Mirror Ryan, wasn't it, the first album? Yeah. And I bought that, and I was like, this is amazing. And do you know what? I've never played that to anybody, and they've not gone, what's this? Mm. I'm like, I was Jamie Woon. And they're like, I've not heard of him. I was like, no, no one has. And it's yeah. like, but then I think once you hear him, that's like, right, I need to find out more about this guy. And, yeah. and I just think, you know, the, the critics love him. And, mm. but yeah, like you say, he doesn't seem to want to walk the path of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a cool kind of pop star, indie star, whatever. He, he just does his thing. And, and, you know, unfortunately, I think like 
it means a lot of people are missing out on him because it's yeah. it's, it's it's criminal. His music's so good, and mm-hmm. yeah. But I mean that that track you said, but what's that? That's probably seven eight years old now, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Right. It must be about seven years old. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree with you. I think most people don't know who he is, yeah. but he's. He, maybe that's his charm though as well for me i mean i don't know how successful successful he wants to be but yeah. but he's just staying in his lane doesn't yeah. care whatever happens and he's yeah. just creating amazing music and the fact he you know he, it is produced by david kumu mm. it's the perfect pairing of two yeah. geniuses for me too perfect choice Okay, well, look, we've already shared out Jamie Rune, who not a lot of people know. So um, you're getting two stabs at this. So tell me a song that you think many people may not know that you would like them to hear for your last track, please. Um, this one, I um, I wondered if people do actually know this song, but it was very new to me, and I'm a massive Burt Bacharach fan. Yeah. Um, always have been, was really sad when he passed, but obviously just kind of delved straight back into his giant back catalogue and it's yeah. incredible but a song that totally escaped me was a song called something big yeah um and it i i can't remember when i first heard it i think i was in a cocktail bar somewhere and i was like i know this is but it's got Bert written all over it from the get-go yeah. and it's his voice obviously um but it's the crazy turnaround at the end with the horns I, I think I listened to it. I went home and listened to it about 20 times on repeat. Yeah. Um, and I think it's his best song he's ever written. Um, and the, the amount of musicians I know who are obsessed with Bert. Yeah. But again, this has escaped them. So that's why this is my, the big one for me oh, that everyone should hear. You said something there that I want to touch upon, which is, um, and I went home and listened to it 20 times. Mm. He's that what you do every time you hear a song that you think oh my god like just play it to death because i I do that all the time drive people mad i'm just like and if they don't get what i'm getting from it i'm like no listen again listen again (laughs) it's like you've got to get it because it's amazing and that will be 20 20 30 i would literally do a whole drive somewhere just with the same song if i'm in the car my own i'm not that horrible but like I would like literally play it and play it and play it and play it until I'm the I've same. just yeah. What do totally you the same. I, I mean, we're obviously a bit obsessive in some way. But <laughs> yeah. I, but I'm exactly the same. I will, um, I'll listen to something like hundreds or thousands of times. Yeah. So I'm the same. If I know, if I know I've got like a five hour drive yeah. and I'm obsessed with the song, I'm like brilliant. <laughs> I can listen to this. <laughs> I can really rack up their Spotify hits just playing this one song. It's, but it, if something gets you, that's yeah. what I love that though about music. If a song gets you or like grabs you, yeah, I listen to it till I'm sick of it, and that will take yeah. me a few weeks and you know, hundreds of thousands of plays. But I, but then you always come back to it, it's always then in my back catalogue of yeah. my favorite things of all time, my favorite songs. Love it, love it. And I'm also always intrigued, um, about people's listening habits. If you wake up and you're feeling blue, you know, you just, you wake up and you're just not feeling it, you're feeling sad. Do you reach for Saturday Night Fever, Michael Jackson, and just dance and, and, and smile your way out of it? Or do you reach for something and embrace that, that sort of blue mm. feeling and, and have that kind of somber moment and, and, and feel the embrace of a, of a sad song? What do you go for? Oh, I love that. I I go for the happy option. Really? Got, I do. It's funny. I was thinking if I love if a song catches me that makes me that then brings me into like a sadness. Yeah. But if I'm feeling sad, I'll allow myself to be in that in silence. Yeah. I yeah. I almost don't want that to be warped in any way by what I'm listening to. If that makes sense, like just keep it. And that worked the it, other way. In so far as you wouldn't want to associate a certain song with a, a, a sad feeling now. Yes, that too, exactly. Yeah. So I like to be like, okay, this is the emotion I'm feeling. Let that kind of breathe in its own way. And then I have a playlist called Spark Joy, which I'm like, <laughs> it's, it's time. It's time to get out the playlist. And then that I go to that, sing at the top of my lungs. And it's got a lot of like Yacht Rock, 80s yeah. power ballads, Love all it. of that good stuff. And then I'm, and then I'm feeling great wonderful well you're talking a playlist so um i should tell you that 
we put together a playlist of all the songs that you've chosen today. And obviously Amazing. we'll be putting uh, your music on there as well. Um, let's talk about that. What's happening with you? Ooh, uh, big things. Yeah, it's exciting. I've got an album coming out at the end of next month yeah. on the 28th of April, which I'm really, really excited about this. I think, uh, yeah, some songs I'm really proud that I've written on this album. So I can't wait to tour them. We've got big European and UK tour all the way through the year, going into next year. And it's so, like I said to you before, just can't wait to get in front of audiences and play the shit out of these songs. So, yeah, it's, it's lots of exciting stuff on the way. Oh, that's great. And so if people want to keep up to speed with releases and tour dates and such, where's the best place to, to keep up to speed? Um, with releases, you follow me on Instagram or Facebook. It'll be all under Izzo Fitzroy. Um, or you can also head to my band camp and my website is ofitzroy.com as well. Wonderful. Well, if it's cool with you, when this comes out, we tag you in all the posts on the social so people Fantastic. can find you if they haven't done already. Izzo, yeah, I've had a real, real lovely time chatting to you, mate. Thank you me so too. much. Me too. I'm going to press so stop. Don't all go right. anywhere. <laughs>